Hey, if you have your Bible, slip on over to Matthew chapter 11. Uh, we are beginning a, a new discussion uh, over the, the next 10 weeks, uh, and we're going to be looking at Jesus' invitation, um, one of the sweetest invitations in all of Scripture, to come to him. And uh, we're going to look at that today. But ultimately, like this discussion, how it's going to shape up over these next uh, 10 weeks is going to be, uh, we're going to be looking at like spiritual rhythms and practices that God has given us as a gift to help us come to Jesus, to help us grow in our relationship with him. And so uh, as you're flipping over there, just a couple of things that, uh, that I want to say to kind of frame this up is like we've, we've spent the last couple of years really, really working hard on driving home the, the biblical concept of being a people that live on mission. Like in other words, that, that's kind of the phrase we use, but what we mean by that is recognizing that God loved you enough for those of you that are followers of Jesus that you would consider yourself as what we call saved. Um, that, that God loved you enough, he was crazy enough about you, that he stepped into your life and that he rescued you and saved you and forgave you, forgive you of your sins. Um, and and, and we, we enjoy that and we celebrate him for that. But like we are a people now who acknowledge that he didn't just save you for you. He saved you for the people around you too. You may be wondering like, well, I'm the only Christian in my friend group or I'm the only Christian in my my workplace or in my family, like that was probably by design because he was calling you out. He rescued you because he's crazy in love with those people too. And now he wants to equip you to be a missionary. All right. Now I know that may sound kind of crazy. We spent two years kind of equipping ourselves to start looking through that lens. And we're going to continue to equip ourselves to know what it looks like to be a missionary in the everyday ordinary stuff of life. But you know, something can happen when you get to doing like get to doing the work of God, like when you get to doing the church stuff and doing the things that the Lord has called us to, it is all too easy. Matter of fact, this is one of Satan's favorite plays in the playbook is just to get Christians busy doing Christian things and forget about Jesus. Um, so we don't want to do that. We recognize that we need to work hard uh, together to, to hold one another accountable, to spend the time and energy to stay centered while we are living sent. And the way we're going to be able to do that is learning how to pick up these practices and rhythms that the Word of God gives us for the long haul. So that we aren't so busy doing Christian things that we're actually disconnecting ourselves from Christ. We want to stay abiding in the vine, clinging to the vine, holding tight to Him, retreating to the feet of the Father on a regular basis. He is the power source, the supply of life and hope and peace and everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness that scripture tells us. And so like, we need to do the work of having the conversation together of what it looks like to come to him and the different vehicles that the Lord has given us so that we can come to him. But like, just so you know, like I wanna make sure we're looking at all this through the right lens. Some of you, if you've grown up in the church world at all, you will probably heard these things referred to as spiritual disciplines. Now this, that's kind of a wooden phrase, so we're gonna go with spiritual practices and rhythms. Um, but essentially, I'm referring to spiritual disciplines. And, and that's going to be a lot of what shapes our conversation over the coming weeks. But let me just be like as clear as I can be with you about that right now. We are not calling our church family into implementing these spiritual disciplines into their life so that we can become more pleasing to God. That's not our goal. Okay. Here's the good news. Let me say that again because I know somebody just missed that. And I missed it most of my life, so I don't want us to miss it anymore. We're not calling you into these spiritual disciplines so that you can learn how to become more pleasing to God. Here's the good news of the gospel. He already delights in you. Crazy about you. He is so enamored by your beauty that it actually got him off of the throne of heaven to come after us, to live with us, to die for us, so that we could be made right with him, so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we could be a part of God's family. He's crazy about you. So don't think reading your Bible or singing songs or showing up to church makes God delight in you more because it does not. He, he delights in you 100% of what he is ever going to delight in you, and it's all right now. What these spiritual practices and rhythms and spiritual disciplines do, it helps us to grow in our understanding and our intimacy of the God who delights in us, the King of heaven and earth who knows you by name. It helps us learn him and draw near to him and understand him better. But now I say all that, these things are meant to help us grow into our intimacy with him. Now I say all that to say this simple truth as well, like 
Um, you may do all of the discip- you may do all the things. Read your Bible and pray and worship and give and serve and still not be connected to Jesus. Matter of fact, Jesus warned us that there would come a day. He says, many on that day, speaking about the day of judgment, he says, many on that day are going to say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do all the things that, you know, church people are supposed to do? And Jesus is going to say to them, depart from me. We didn't even know each other. You did all the christian things, but never knew Christ. You know what I'm saying? We're not going to make that mistake here. <laughs> I want to make sure that we know the king of glory. I want to make sure that we're pressing back against some of that cultural religion that quite frankly draws us away from understanding the one true king. And we're going to constantly press back against that because I, we want to make sure that we are seeing Jesus how he was meant to be seen so we can know him and love him the way he was meant to be loved. And he's crazy about you. This spiritual practice has helped us learn how to be equally as crazy about him. And I can tell you, the more you discover him, the more you're going to love him. It's impossible to go the opposite direction on that one. That's what we're doing this for. But we don't need to be under any illusions that some of y'all holy rollers up in here got up extra early this morning, read six chapters of the Bible. You prayed your prayers. You hopped in your car and you sang your christian songs on the way. And look at you sitting in church. Well, I'll be... We don't need to be under any illusions that that in and of itself is our relationship to God. All right? Those spiritual practices are not our relationship to Jesus. They are the vehicle that we drive into his arms. You hear what I'm saying? I'll say that again. Those spiritual practices are not our relationship to Jesus. They're the vehicles that we get to use to drive into his arms. You, You literally could read the Bible cover to cover to cover to cover many times throughout your whole life and still not be still not be in relationship to the Lord. We can miss it. We don't want to miss it. We want to make sure that we are looking at these things through the right lens so that we are using those things to come to Jesus to grow up in our relationship with him. Because the the opposite would also be true. Let's not pretend that we have a relationship with Jesus if we aren't doing those things in our lives. You know what I'm saying? The opposite's true too. Like let's not pretend that we have a relationship with Jesus if we aren't meeting him in the places that he told us to meet up at. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to start this conversation with simply just Jesus' invitation. We won't get into the spiritual disciplines for another couple weeks. We're going to take a two-week look at Jesus' invitation to come to him. And this is some of the sweetest words in the entire Bible. And Jesus says these words to us. Come to me. All you who labor. Some of your Bibles translate that word as weary. It's the same word. All you who are labor and you weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let that soak in for just a second. This is the words of Jesus, the king of heaven and earth, the author and creator of all things. The one to whom the angels cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty all day long to. The one of whom we talked about last week, that the day will come that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord. He is the king. He is tops. He is preeminent. He is number one. He's the one that conquered death. He's the one that's madly in love with you. He's the one that has offered for you to be saved and reconciled with God and forgiven of sins. And this powerful, matchless king says these very intimate words like a father would. Come to me, all you who are weary and labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We'll talk about the second part of that next week, but the first part, come to me, all you who weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I wonder how many of y'all could use a little more peace and rest in your life right now. I wonder how many of you, you got so much on your mind or so much chaos going on in your lives or you just got a phone call that flipped your world upside down and you desperately need peace and rest. Well, Jesus said, when you come to me, I will give you rest.
Let's spend a little time just looking at that so we don't under, misunderstand the invitation. Because I want to make sure you have access to this. I want to make sure that you leave here today postured and poised in your life to come to Jesus so that you can have the rest that he offers because he wants to give it to you. He wants you to find rest in him. Trust me, God is not withholding peace and rest from you because he's, he's like trying to teach you something in your unrestless or in your restless state. Th this, is, this is a promise that he wants to answer. It's not a promise to fix all of our circumstances. It's not a promise when you come to me, then I'll fix all the things that you wanted me to fix. Because if that was the case, if coming to Jesus meant that we could get out of him what we wanted from him, we would end up worship, worshiping the fact that we either got our bad circumstances fixed or whatever. We wouldn't learn to realize that he is enough. So we need to learn to come to him so that we can find peace and rest regardless of what our circumstances are in our life. Like that's real peace. Peace is not a storm being calmed. Peace is having rest even if it's storming. That's what peace looks like. And that's the kind of peace Jesus offers and models for us. And he says, come to me. And when you do, I will give you rest. But I wanted to start, because I know that there are many of us that could use this this morning. I wanted to make sure you knew exactly what criteria was necessary to be able to come to Jesus to get this peace and rest. Did you notice the list that he gave us? For those of you that want the peace and rest in order to come to Jesus, did, did, you, see the, did you see the criteria you have to meet? Uh, come to me, uh, those who have a pretty good track record over the last couple months in their prayer life and church attendance and all that. No, that's not what it said. Uh, come to me, all of you who have been being good boys and girls and, you know, hadn't said too many wordy dirds lately, you know. Y'all been behaving pretty good. Y'all come to me. When you get yourself cleaned up enough, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm God. I'm the king of glory. Don't you come bringing that riffraff into my presence. You need to tidy things up in your life a little bit before you come to me and get the rest that I've. That wasn't the criteria, was it? Did you see who qualifies to come to Jesus for peace and rest? All who are weary and heavy laden. And that's it. Whether you've been walking with Jesus for decades or whether you just stumbled across this video online or stumbled in here this morning and you're wondering if God would ever accept you or take you back or be willing to offer to you what he has, uh, there's your answer. Come to me. You weary and heavy laden? That's, that's all it takes. The prophet Isaiah even told us when God spoke, he says, come to me all you who are thirsty. Even those of you that can't afford to buy what I have to give, you won't be able to afford it anyway. Just come to me and I'll give you rest. You'll find rest in me. You know, one of the big mistakes that we make, and this is a, a tension that we're going to wrestle th through throughout this conversation that we're having. One of the big mistakes that we make when it comes to trying to find the peace and rest that only Jesus can offer is believing that we will find that peace and rest in either a practice or a place. Let me say that again. One of the big mistakes we make is believing that we're going to find the rest of Jesus in either a practice or a place. Some of y'all came here this morning because you needed some peace and rest in your life. Things got so chaotic. So something in you said, you know, it go to church because once you get to that place, then you'll be able to find some rest and peace there. Uh, some of you may have whipped out your Bible this morning or may have thrown on some Christian music on the radio on your way in because you were convinced, like something told you, like, well, if I just... If I just start doing this practice or this habit differently, then I'll be able to find some peace and rest there. But if you'll notice what Jesus says right here, that you can't find peace and rest in a practice. You can't find peace and rest in a place. You can only find it in a person. So he says, come to me. He doesn't say go to church. He doesn't say pick up that book. He doesn't say listen to that podcast. He doesn't say call that preacher. Heck, you've already tried half of that anyway. No, he says, come to me. Come to me. Bypass all of the resources so you can arrive on the shore of the source where peace and rest really is. Come to me. You know, it's, it's funny that I would call that a mistake. And one of the biggest mistakes we make is thinking we're going to find peace and rest in a practice or a place. Because the funny thing is this whole series is going to be built around spiritual practices and rhythms. And so it's like there's the tension. 
That's why I want to make sure that we know, and you're going to hear this on repeat, those practices are not our relationship to Jesus. They're just the vehicles we drive into his arms. You hear that? Those practices, us doing the things or us going to the locations, that's not our relationship with Jesus. Checking the box is not our relationship with Jesus. These are just the vehicles that he's given us to drive into his arms so we can come to him. You know, how we make that mistake often is we search his word for answers instead of searching his word for him. Oh, but you read the Bible. Kudos to you, you know what I'm saying? I read the Bible six times this week. Were you searching the word for answers or were you searching the word for him? Oh, man, dude, I, I love the songs that we were singing in church. I really sang out with all of my heart this morning. Were you singing them because you love the song or were you singing them because you were seeing Jesus or searching for him? You see, we can do all the things and still totally miss the king of glory in the process. This is why we don't want to make this state, mistake as a church family. We want to be reminded Jesus is not in a place. It's not in practice. Jesus is a person and his rest is found in his person. This is why he says, come to me. This is why on repeat throughout the scriptures, he tells us John 15, abide in me and I'll abide in you. He says, abide in me. In Matthew chapter 11, he says, come to me. Haven't you already tried everything else, Grace Bible? I mean, did, why, why is it that like so many Christians have bookshelves riddled with Christian literature of explanations and strategies on how to will yourself into a place of peace and rest in your life, but yet so many Christians are still so daggum restless because they don't work. It's, it's the grace of God to let all of our other props be knocked out from under us so we recognize that only he is enough. That's one of the greatest mysteries to be revealed in the life of any Christian. And for some of us, it takes us a lifetime to get it. But I'm just praying that the Holy Spirit would allow the light switch of your heart to flick on this morning and recognize like that there is no other way to be satisfied and there is no other way to find peace and rest but to come to him. Because I bet you've already been there and done that, hadn't you? I mean, you read the book, you watched the video, you met with the preacher. You changed your habits, you listened to the sermons, you went to the conference, and it's Jesus saying right here, like, hey, you've tried all that already and didn't work, did it? So since you've gone there and done that, why don't you come here and come to me? You know, it's funny, right before Jesus tells us these words, before he gives us this beautiful invitation, he actually reveals a secret of heaven and a secret of the way God works before he even gives the invitation. And I call this a secret because, quite honestly, it's going to be so profound and counterintuitive to the average Bible-thumping churchgoer that we're going to just, like, graze right past this and miss the fact that this kind of precedes his invitation to come to him to find peace and rest. And this is the secret that Jesus tells us. He says in verse 25, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have, listen, you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Look at that for just a second. I thank you, God, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding, and you just revealed them to babies. You know why we can't find peace and rest, O oh Christ follower? Because you know too daggone much. You read too much junk. You've heard way too many sermons. You've watched way too many Christian movies and heard way too many Christian songs. And because of that, you are so wise and understanding that you are missing the presence of Jesus. And we can't find his peace and rest because it's like we feel like he can be found in the resources and we forget that he is the source. That's it. Like we got to go to him. You know what that also tells me? That we let religious people talk us right out of our peace and rest all the time. I'm talking about your preacher right here too. 
You may have heard a thing I said in a sermon. You thought, oh, that's the key that's going to unlock this. I'm just telling you today, come to him. Retreat to the feet of the Father. Like, we're not even getting to the spiritual disciplines part today because I don't want us to make the mistake of thinking that that spiritual discipline is going to fix our lives. I want us to be able to see the invitation first in all of its fullness so that we know those spiritual rhythms are just the bridge that he has given us to be able to come. And we let religious people talk us right out of our peace all the time because we go to them and we say, hey, what do I do? I'm so... I'm so, my life is just so upside down right now. What am I supposed to do? They're like, well, you need to pray harder. You need to fast more. You need to worship harder. You need to go to church more often. All of those things have some truth to them. But all of those things aren't Jesus. They're just ways to him. You know? And when we pray harder and we sing louder, and we serve more, and we still feel defeated, we start turning and looking at God saying, where are you? Why didn't you deliver? I thought this was supposed to work. Because you never came to me. You went to the soup kitchen. You went to church. You went to a book. You went to a video. You went to a pastor. I said, come to me, and you'll find rest for your souls. Jesus even went as far to saying this, some of y'all are going to be so offended by what Jesus says right here. He even went as far to say, some of y'all have missed me because you're so enamored searching through the Bible. And this is what he said to him. He says, John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40, he says, you've searched the scriptures. And good for you, man. You've been reading your Bible like a champ. Pat on the back. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me. Yet you refuse to, what's that phrase right there? Yet you refuse to, oh, it ain't showing yet. Yet you refuse to, what's that phrase right there? Come to me that you may have life. Y'all catching that? He was talking to some really spiritual, churchy people that were doing all the right Christian things. Man, they were thumbing through the Bible every day. They were talking about it. They were probably teaching it. But yet we're missing Jesus all along. He says, y'all made a mistake. You've mistaken even, even the very words of God. You've mistaken this resource as the source. Jesus is revealed in here. But if we're just looking for answers in here and we're not looking for Jesus, we won't find him. If we start to look at this as a textbook to be studied and understood instead of a love letter to be felt and changed by, even the Bible can be a distraction. Come to me. We're going to kick this off. The first spiritual discipline we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks is actually going to be the study of the word of God. Because this is his revealed word. This is him speaking to us. This is a great place to find Jesus. And what he has for our lives. Like, this is really important. And so one of the things that we're going to put into play in a couple weeks is Pastor Cam and his team are putting together um, a, a kind of daily Bible reading plan so that we as a church family can read through the New Testament together between two weeks from now and the end of the year. So we're just going to introduce the rhythm of searching for Jesus in his word together. Not looking for answers, looking for him. Every day. Rhythmically, we're going to put that practice into place. I bet it's going to change some lives for those of you that will immerse yourself into that. But Jesus is telling them right here, and we could fall victim to the same thing. He's saying you have learned the word, but you haven't learned me. The scriptures point to me. They, they reveal me to the world. He says, come to me. And when you do, Grace Bible, when you do, Jesus says this promise, I will give you rest. You know, because Jesus said that in Hebrew, and through time we've had to, when we translate it into English to make it make sense to us, we miss the fullness of what Jesus said right there. So let me, let me translate his exact Hebrew words into English, exact words into English. Jesus says, when you come to me, 
all you who are weary and heavy laden. In Hebrew, Jesus says, I will rest you. I mean, I like hearing him say, I'll give you rest. But what he really said is, when you come to me, I will rest you. You know what? That makes him the doer and me just the receiver. All I got to do is show up for the party, retreat to the feet of the Father, and he will rest me. That's his promise. He'll do the work. I just, gotta, I just get to sit there and bask in his peace. People are like, well, how, how exactly that work? It sounds a little mystical and like far-fetched. Well, it's the same way for those of you that are Christians, the same way your salvation worked. When you came to Jesus, you didn't then have to figure out how to save you. When you came to Jesus, you didn't have to then figure out how to get forgiveness for you. No, when you came to Jesus, he saved you. He forgave you. You just got a chance to enjoy the results of your belief in Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. So I'm asking you to do the same thing right here. He says, when you come to me, just like your salvation story, I did the work, you did the receiving. I did the doing, you did the basking. And my peace is going to work the same way. You come to me, and I will rest you. And that's good news. Because if you're anything like me, by the time I get to Jesus, I'm so weary that if there was anything else that I had to do, I wouldn't be able to do it. I'm so weary because I tried so many other ways. And he invites you, it doesn't matter what your spiritual disposition is this morning, it does not matter what you did last night. It doesn't matter what the last three months of your life looked like, the last 12 years of your life looked like. You might be the most faithful churchgoer. You might be somebody wandering off in the far country that has been so disconnected from even any thought of a relationship with Jesus. The invitation from him is still the same. All you who are weary and heavy laden, you come to me. That's the only criteria is needing him. And he longs to be that solution. He longs to give us peace and rest. He longs for us to experience him. He longs for the day that we go through all the ups and downs and hardships of life, that we finally come to the realization that Jesus is enough. That's why it is the love of God. It is the love of God in your story to let things unravel. God's first priority in your life is not comfort. It's not happiness. It's transformation and holiness. And if you anything like me, the only way I'm going to change is if it starts to hurt. It's the love of God to allow our lives to slip into the crucible of crisis. Because it is in that place that God does his greatest work in us. You know why he does his greatest work there? Because you officially had to get out of the way. You finally laid down your books and your plans and your strategies and your procedures and you realize that your pastor doesn't even have any magic words to fix your life. And you have come to the end of your rope. which left you with the only option to pick up the beginning of his. Come to me. Come to me and I will rest you. I think we need to spend a few minutes this morning just coming to Jesus. It will do us no good to have a conversation like this knowing the myriad of life stuff going on in your world and my world and just nod our heads and say amen and figure out where to eat lunch. Let's create some space right now while the Lord is speaking very sincerely and directly to some of us. Let's create some space to just come to him. What does that look like, Dustin? I mean, should I come down to the altar? 
Sure. Yeah. Should I stay here in my seat and just pray? Yeah. Should I open up the word and just kind of soak up in his words? Yeah. I don't know how it is that the Lord is inviting you to come to him, but I'm just saying let's carve out some space and let's go. Let's go. Some of y'all, I'm asking a couple of our leaders to be at the stage. Any one of y'all over here probably. Etienne, you run over there. Some of y'all just as a physical act of submission just need to come down and get before the Lord at the altar. As just an example of your surrender and coming to him. Some of you need to come down as a family or as a married couple. Some of y'all might need to grab one of our pastors or team members and just, just confess things in your life that you need prayer about. That is impeding you from coming to Jesus like he has called you to. I bet you there's some folks in here that don't yet know Jesus, that have never surrendered their life to him, and maybe you thought he was found in a place or a practice. Let me tell you, like, the promised land was a thing of the old covenant. There no longer is a promised land. There is now a promised one, and his name is Jesus. There is no promised practice or promised place. There is only the righteous King, Jesus, and he invites us to come. All you who are weary, no matter where you're at in your story, you come. So I hope that you'll take these next few minutes to do so. Don't waste another moment. Don't wait. You just go before him, however he leads you to, and we're here to serve you in that way. I'm just going to sit here and pray over us. You do as the Lord leads you to.
continue to get before the Lord as I just feel led to read his words over you again. Come to me, all you who labor, who are tired and weary and wounded and defeated. All of you right now, whoever is weary and heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Don't come as a learned, understanding one. Come as a child. Not needing to have all your questions answered, but trust him. trust him. May the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Jesus, I sense that there is so much chaos going on in somebody's story right now that the, very, the dissonance in their mind is so loud that they can't even hear your voice. Spirit, would you break through the fog and the noise? Would you bring peace that surpasses all understanding? A hope that is unshakable. Courage. that is resilient. Lord, I know that you have promised that you are with us and you are in us. those that claim Christ Jesus as Lord and King, we are not alone. Lord, I pray that this invitation from your word to come to you is something that just continually pricks our hearts. That we don't transition our day to day into something else. And it draw us away from hearing your voice. God, I pray that as we're eating lunch and on the lake and watching football and being with family, that the still small voice of God would prick our hearts. Over and over and over and over again, come to me.
the stillness of the night as we are preparing to fall asleep, God, let us hear your voice to come. In our dreams, Lord, would you beckon us to come. We need peace and rest, and we have been taught to find it in every other avenue, and they have all failed. We know that you won't fail us. But we haven't been taught how to get to you. Would you show us? Would you draw us in? Would you wrap your arms around us? Would you cling to us as we cling to you? And we thank you for your work and your love. There is none like you. Lord, change us for your glory. Restore us. Give us peace. Give us help. Give us comfort in you and in nothing else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, yeah, you, you need to come up here and tell us some things. But while you're coming up here to tell us some things, Chris, um, I forgot to tell y'all something that's pretty awesome. It was actually supposed to be a part of the sermon, and then I just got, you know, thinking about the sermon stuff. But um, we are, I'm excited to announce to you guys that, you know, we've, we've been calling our church family Live on Mission. I love to share missional stories. I don't want to miss this opportunity. But um, you, it's, we've got a lot of Christian coaches in our community and um, that really take that as their mission field, the families, the coaches, the kids that play on their team. Uh, and one really cool story that has happened recently is uh, Lake Placid, football coaches, um, several of which call this their church home and they attend here, one of which is a deacon this weekend. You'll see him out there. He's the, you know, studly jack looking dude, looks like a football player. Well, they decide, you know, it's hard for our kids to get to church on Wednesday nights after practice because it's just a quick turnaround once you get cleaned up. And most of the kids aren't going to church anyway, so why don't we just start having some church for the kids that want to come? These are football coaches now, not preachers, not missionaries, football coaches who recognize their kingdom calling to be a missionary. So let's just start having church. We'll share devotional time. We'll talk about the Lord. We'll have a meal with the kids. So they decided to start doing this in their home. And this has been going on for two weeks. Week one, um, Coach White, the head football coach at Lake Placid, uh, after their time of Bible study, shared the gospel with his football players. There were 12 students there. Um, that showed up for that, 12 of those kids confessed Jesus Christ as their king for the first time in their life. But wait, there's more. So, so these kids, little evangelists, started telling their other friends at, at practice, man, you got to come to Coach White's house on Wednesday night. You know, they feed us pizza, we talk about God, and like, you got to come, it's pretty cool. You know, we throw Coach White in the pool, all the good stuff. And so they did. So there was 24. I, so I got to go this past week just to observe on Wednesday night. 24 kids showed up, eight more kids after the gospel was presented except Jesus Christ the Lord. So listen, listen to this. Let me, let me tell you this. So at Lake Placid High School football team, 20 kids have crossed from death to life in the last 10 days. 20 kids on a football team. So we celebrate that. That's why, that's why we've got to stay centered while we're living sin. Because now the work is discipling these kids to grow in their relationship with Jesus. We're going to be planning a baptism service just for those kids. Um, I'd love to do it here, but I think that's going to be too complicated. So we're probably going to end up doing it at the Lake Placid football field uh, here in the next few weeks or so. We're going to do a baptism class with all those that confess Jesus. We're going to have a big old fat baptism service, offer a giant meal for them and their families. I'll let you know the details when I know it. But I just had to tell you that God is still doing extraordinary things. And he's doing them. And the next generation, the leaders of tomorrow. And so I celebrate that. Let's celebrate and give thanks to the Lord for that as I pass it off to Chris.